we're going to move to the next speaker, which is uh, Stefan Alpner uh, from uh, InnoMedica. Um, so, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to present to you our latest um, insights coming from clinical applications of, in our case, liposomes. Um, we have some new data in treating solid tumors uh, in oncology and also treating Parkinson's disease in an entirely new way um, from neurology. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Um, I'll give a bit of a bivalent perspective of the, uh, into this, uh, me being e on, on one hand a, a scientist, a biochemist, but on the other hand also an entrepreneur, um, having to uh, maneuver in an entirely different world um, that is mostly driven um, actually by psychology and money and uh, humans basically making decisions, which is something very different than scientific data, actually. Um, it's interesting to merge those two worlds. Um, so before I actually I can share some quite e encouraging um, data, I also want to share some bad news. Um, when I finished my PhD in 2012, um, this paper from Scannell and colleagues came out um, showing that uh, over the basically entire period of observation, efficacy of R&D spending is in, in, a, in a downward trend. And so nanomedicines can be greatly effective, but if the dollars spent to develop those are greatly ineffective, then we still have a very big problem. And I think uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, since then, um, new data has come out from Alexander Schumacher and colleagues, Oliver Gassmann, showing that uh, unfortunately the problem has not been resolved. Um, on, on the contrary, uh, it has been aggravating quite severely. Um, so this came out uh, late 2023 now. Um, we're at 6 billion above, actually, for a new drug. And um, so I think these are, although I'm not a fan of man, money and capitalism, but uh, it's just something we have to be um, aware of and we have to figure out uh, better ways of uh, doing actually money effective R&D. And so I think our uh, nanomedicine can do uh, maybe some service here. Um, one thing that uh, Innomedica strives for is uh, to actually make um, many very useful drugs even more useful. And uh, so I think, for example, doxorubicin, it has been around since 1950. So like 70 years later, it's still a heavily used drug and I think while the drug is quite good, the formulation that it's used mostly as a free drug formula, well, it's, I think it has issues. And one of the issues is that to upgrade molecules into technologically more advanced systems um, comes along with uh, an, uh, still a, a large effort that you need to take in uh, clinical studies and the regulatory and bureaucracy and finding investments for it. Um, so I think the chances for nanomedicines of essential medicines to become to be successful, they are quite high. Um, I think it's technologically very feasible to make these formulations, um, but currently I think from regulations and financing there's still um, quite some um, hurdles to take um, to make those drugs a reality, um, which I think is quite a good idea on, you know, liposomal pain, um, management, uh, antibiotics, uh, cancer drugs. I think we need them and we should develop them and we should uh, find ways to do so. Um, so our way is to do full vertical integration. I think the most uh, prominent example for this is uh, Tesla, which basically um, came up uh, or is like the most known company. Um, we're trying to do that uh, also since the very beginning, a, a very do-it-yourself focused approach with uh, R&D, GMP, and regulatory, QC, everything on, under one roof, because you can be innovative in basically all areas, especially in pharmaceutical manufacturing. You have like hundreds of steps. Um, with, within each step, you can be innovative. Um, so now to the better news. 
So TLD1 is basically the, the academic exercise um, pivoting the entire field. Because if you say like, yeah, okay, we want to have 200 different nanodrugs now for, for all these uh, essential medicines or even more, um, which liposome do you then take? And I thought like, okay, doxyl has been around for a long time. It has been sort of posti been, been postulated to be a, a gold standard, which I fully understood. It was very inspiring to me to actually have that innovation at hand and compare free drug doxorubicin against calyx and then against tolidox because those two drugs, calyx and uh, the other blastin, had already so much data in the clinics. Because in preclinics, you, you're very uncertain about uh, many, many readouts that you get, whether or not this will be true in humans. Um, so we added a couple of uh, design elements, uh, especially making the particles uh, about half of the size of uh, doxyl calyx. Um, we surface peculated the liposomes in a way that the pec chains point only outwards. Um, and also uh, increasing the density of those pack chains. Um, and also we changed for, uh, the drug to lipid ratio in a way that we have much more lipids um, as opposed to drugs. Um, reasons for this are mostly that uh, the first liposomes that enter the bloodstream, they usually get uh, taken up by clearance systems like liver and spleen. And so you want the liver to be busy basically digesting liposomes, but not really drugs. So it's a bit uh, something similar in a way as a curadime is doing with their nanoprimers or other approaches. Um, and also that's quite beneficial to have a better drug release. Here you can see some um, physicochemical characteristics, uh, including cryotems that were about half the size and uh, about five to six times the particle density. And I think this is quite interesting when it comes then to performance of the drug in human subjects. So here see, you see uh, F, uh, side e, uh, undesired drug effects um, coming from the first 30 patients treated with TLD um, compared to literature values actually um, from the registrational studies for the reference drugs. Um, so you can appreciate that I think there's less red um, there, there's uh, no cardiotoxicity, neutropenia is very low, so I think it generally all the irreversible side effects, they have been managed quite well, like peripheral neuropathy, neuropathy cardiotoxicity, then um, how the drug behaves uh, at the site of injection, basically the bloodstream, um, also quite nice, and I'll give more reasons why uh, we think actually to plausibilize this. Um, also, a bit uh, the aspects of well-being seem to be quite well. Um, unfortunately, the, the dose-limiting effects are still the skin toxicity. Um, we have to take into consideration that we use the slightly higher dose intensity in this case, as uh, is referenced here for calyx. And still, this is quite a high dose. So usually these days, uh, around 10 milligrams per square meter per week are, are what we aim for. Um, also, these patients have been uh, heavily pretreated with multiple lines of chemotherapy, so might, might have been a, a bit uh, more fragile than when you go further up line, so first and second line treatments maybe. Um, here you see an efficacy waterfall plot of the breast cancer patients. We have also treated other forms of solid tumors, but since uh, it's doxorubicin, breast cancer turned out to be the most responsive one. And um, well, yeah, I think uh, there, there have been some quite good responses, some um, rather moderate um, benefits, unfortunately. Overall, a clinical benefit ratio of 75%, I think, is still um, noteworthy, although obviously we have no control arm in this setting, so we don't really know um, how good or how bad this really is. Um, just saying so much to it. Um, so obviously now uh, everybody thinks like, okay, how, how does the the liposome behave in terms of uh, progression-free survival, um, overall survival. So for this, uh, oh, sorry, no, I'm a bit too far. Uh, this is now the, the pharmacokinetics study that we did. So we, we had 14 patients treated with Tolidox or Doxil um, and then crossover. And so a intra-patient pharmacokinetics comparison. So you can see after one week, you have basically doubled the amount of doxorubicin still in blood where, um, for the TLD1 Tolidox formula as opposed to doxil. Um, and I think if you, if you uh, 
calculate how much that uh, amount of doxorubicin actually represents in terms of particles, it's actually 10 times more particles in blood. Um, and that uh, two weeks post-injection, you have actually 15 times more particles in blood, which may seem like a lot, but actually the total amount is quite um, small already after two weeks. Um, so we have uh, a half-life of approximately 127 hours, which I think is quite a, a nice thing. So overall, um, we are obviously looking at the question, um, we need to maximize the chances for successful tumor delivery. And so having just more particles available, available for a longer amount of time while they're being also smaller, I think is a beneficial aspect. Um, you can plot that over time and just uh, you can see that basically the delta of the two drugs increases um, over time and starts at the number of, of a ratio of one. And actually the capability of the Talidoc system to retain the drug in blood is greater, as you can see here in the bottom right. Um, the, the, because the retention capability is measured uh, through the amount of uh, doxorubicin that is present versus the one that is actually released. Um, just metabolites are indistinguishable. And so now here, um, this is the study setting that we're looking at to make a proof about the efficacy endpoints in a comparative setting. Um, so now also uh, an entirely different thing. This is a talinurin, um, short TLN. It's a, a liposome um, with a very different um, phospholipid composition. It's composed of sphingomyelin, cholesterol, and GM1 ganglioside. GM1 ganglioside is uh, unique basically to neurological tissues, mostly, not entirely, but uh, it's heavily overexpressed in neurons and the brain. And it does quite some interesting things if you give this uh, therapeutically. So we produced the drug with like, tons of preclinical stuff um, and then uh, launched a clinical trial in Parkinson's disease, uh, slowly escalating the dose. Um, up to 720 milligrams, then uh, dose consolidation um, with uh, nine additional patients, so 12 in total. Follow up, um, we had primary outcomes of, of, of course, the safety aspects, but also secondary outcomes like uh, efficacy readouts. We do that in Parkinson's with uh, UPDRS measurements. Um, Talinurin was given once weekly by IV injection and as a, an add-on setting so pa patients could take all the medicines they anyways had and just take talinurin on top of it because it works entirely different than any other treatment they would use, usually get. Um, and so here what I can show you is uh, the blue line which is basically the expected progression of Parkinson's over a half a year. And the drug, uh, the, the, the disease, unfortunately, just uh, progresses over time, gets worse. I think uh, it was very nice for us to see that uh, we could actually improve um, those patients very, quite significantly. Um, so almost all patients or all patients had wished to um, continue. And that we were able basically to push back the disease uh, significantly and hold the progression for the time observed. We have now also data from almost a year of treatment, which I don't show here, um, but uh, the, the trend is the same. So here you see the 24-week readout um, with the dashed boxes for each patient showing the anticipated progression and with the filled um, bars, the improvement they were actually seeing for the, their disease status. Um, so all in all, uh, a very encouraging thing, especially also given that the drug was extremely well tolerated. It's composed entirely of uh, biological molecules um, that are endogenous to the body. Um, so this is a, a more a different view on it. Uh, before we had the total score um, assessing also aspects of daily living and so forth. Here we have only the motor functions so almost all patients um, had a significant improvement um, on less one, which was basically uh, a bit uh, um, progressive within expectations. But generally a very good response um, to the drug. Um, I was not the first to come up with GM1 for Parkinson's. Actually, Jay Schneider um, published a paper in 2013, which was the reason why we only uh, embarked on this project. 
Um, so in brief, uh, we basically doubled the effect size that uh, was found in previous studies in 2013 with GM1 in Parkinson's. It's very interesting, it was already placebo controlled, so great from a de-risking perspective. Um, we reduced the amount of drug needed by 50%, we reduced the amount of injections needed by 93%, and uh, obviously, you cannot patent GM1. You can patent, however, liposomes uh, with GM1 in a special way. Um, and that is necessary if you want to do things uh, commercially these days, unfortunately. Um, sorry, I'm a bit out of uh, time, just briefly. Uh, the thing works also in ALS, for which we got now an orphan drug designation. Here we have a preclinical data showing that talinurine treatment uh, increases survival of mice having uh, the C9 open reading frame 72 mutation in ALS. Um, and also you can give it orally. You see the green line are treated animals. The, the, the shaded areas have been treated area, uh, treatment periods and basically the animals in motor performance on the rotor rod, they did as good as healthy controls. Um, so yeah, wrap up and uh, thank you very much for your time.